Well, good afternoon to you uh, as we join together and as Zoom screens click in or not. Um, my name's Christopher. I'm from uh, Resource. Really good to see you if we're meeting for the first time. Uh, with me is Roger from Christian Music Ministries. We will continue these um, introductions informally whilst people are finding their way uh, onto Zoom. Um, feel free to share your video uh, or not uh, as you wish. We'll be going into uh, breakout rooms twice within the course of um, the time together. Um, though, of course, if you wish to opt out of that, that is um, completely at your discretion. Um, hello, uh, Angela. Very nice to see you uh, again. I mean, it's very nice to see everyone, but I just particularly wanted to welcome Angela again. Um, great. Well, I think um, people are um, either joining with video or not. So I will kind of formally begin uh, and then we can um, get underway. Um as I say, my name is Christopher Lando. I'm the director of Resource, uh, and really thrilled to be working on this with Roger, Roger Jones from Christian Music Ministries. But Roger and I have been working together um, within the life of Resource uh, for um, a few years now, really. Yeah, and uh, Roger is uh, what we call a resource minister, um, meaning that he is one of the people who very uh, generously give of their time to help uh, in the ministry that we do uh, around the country um, uh, through the, the Ministry of Resource. Um, so Roger and I will uh, introduce uh, ourselves briefly uh, and then both share a bit of an opening reflection. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the uh, program on the website that gives you a sense of what we're doing uh, over the next uh, hour and a half. Um, <clears throat> then we will move into some breakout rooms for some discussion. Um, that will be two rooms, so uh, one with Roger, one with me. I'm afraid you don't have any choice uh, as to um, as to who you go with, but so uh, you will find yourself miraculously in a breakout room, um, which will be an opportunity to to share if you wish, some of the issues and challenges in relation to your own context. Um, then we will come back for some more um, contributions from Roger and myself, but also further opportunity for uh, comments, questions, uh, sharing of your own experiences. Uh, and then towards the end of the time, we'll go back into the breakout rooms for prayer um, and we'll end uh, in, in those breakout rooms. Um, some of you I know joined us some months ago now for uh, an open meeting that we put on really just to raise the question of are there particular issues and challenges for those particularly in smaller churches wishing to see uh, music and sung worship renewed in some way uh, and was there um, something that Roger and I might usefully uh, offer in that sense. Uh, and so we have this series of three seminars coming up. Uh, and we do also, uh, we're just in the process of confirming um, a 24 hour retreat uh, based at Cudston in Oxfordshire on the 5th and 6th of July uh, for anyone who may be interested uh, in taking these things further and obviously being able to do rather more practically uh, in person than one can uh, on Zoom. Though Roger is uh, promising to connect his keyboard to Zoom uh, in future weeks, but not this week. Um, <laughs> so, um, Roger, do you want to just say a little bit about your own background and what brings you here, as it were? Yes, well, hi, everyone. Um, I direct Christian Music Ministries, and some of you will know of me from being a composer of musicals, but actually the, the other string or another string to my bow is very much in leading worship and making worship work in a particularly an Anglican con uh, context or a, a mainline denominational context. I spend a lot of time in the Methodist church these days, but really altogether wanting worship to connect because my heart, as with resources, is in renewal, renewal in the power of the spirit, people connecting. And uh, for me, without the connection, uh, we're just making music. So that's where my heart is. Um, we've we've published a few things on that line, and we also do lots of seminars. One of my, most of my time we spent going around the country somewhere, doing a weekend or a day or an evening in a church, 
particularly talking about worship, but doing it from a practical point of view. I, I have a school teaching background, as Christopher knows, and, and uh, uh, I kind of feel that unless I'm doing something with visuals, I'm not really connecting. It's much more than words. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Roger. And I suppose I should mention um, that I did a huge amount of church music sort of through the earlier part of my life, uh, uh, somewhat, no, not embarrassingly, but, I, you know, I was a choir boy and a rough and that kind of thing. And then uh, an organist in a village church uh, through my teenage years because uh, the hourly rate meant uh, I made a lot more money than my friends who were stacking shelves in Morrison's uh, or Safeway, uh, as it then was. Uh, you know, a, a wedding in a Herefordshire village was very good money for a a, a teenage organist. Um, I was also then a, a choral scholar um, in Cambridge as an undergraduate, you know, so immersed in the Anglican choral tradition, um, but often asking questions about the relationship between um, the beauty and the professionalism uh, in the performance of sacred music but actually what was going on in people's hearts. Uh, and um, and in a sense, um, through this work, what we're very keen to, to think about is what's possible uh, in the small uh, and with the people who are not expert, uh, as well as um, honouring the wonderful things that might be happening in cathedrals uh, or in other contexts. So um, those are that's a little bit about Roger uh, and I and um, shortly we will as I say go into those breakout rooms and there'll be the opportunity for you to uh, share a little bit about your own context uh, and where you're from. Um, but both Roger and I thought it might be helpful just initially to offer um, a few texts and pointers uh, to give a bit of a theological basis for where we're starting from uh, and I wanted to do that in relation to some of the parables of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 13, uh, and really in particular, the repeated emphasis that we find there on the value uh, and the potential within God's kingdom of the small and even the apparently insignificant. Um, resources, many of you know, works particularly and has always talked about working with little local ordinary churches uh, and in a sense rather unashamedly we often say that no church we believe is too small or too out of the way or too battered by pastoral reorganization or whatever it might be to be beyond uh, God's presence to be beyond God's renewing work um, and that uh, extends through to the kind of work we do in retreat houses, the kinds of resources that we seek to create. Um, but crucially with this, that sense that um, when it comes to the place of music and sung worship within the life of the church, that we shouldn't feel if we are eight, nine, ten people gathered together, that somehow uh, that is inherently less in terms of the possibility of what God can do uh, in our midst. Um, and it seems to me that Matthew 13 is not a bad place to be reminded of some of these themes, um, not least because of this repeated picture of the seed. Uh, you can hardly get something smaller or more apparently initially insignificant. Um, but of course, the, the encouragement of the parable of the sower is partly to to keep on sowing. And it may be that for some of you, that encouragement uh, simply to keep on uh, in the context that you're in uh, is part of um, how you, know, you can find some encouragement uh, today. But I want to particularly draw attention to these well-known images, of course, of the, the mustard seed and the yeast. Mm -hmm. So from verse 31, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field, though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. And, you know, we don't know what will happen to the seeds that we plant but I hope that we do believe in a God who can take that apparently insignificant or unpromising seed and 
turn it into something extraordinary. And actually, even if we feel as though we're rather stuck in a situation where our contribution or our church fellowship uh, is small, we should remember the impact that that small amount of yeast nonetheless has on the dough uh, as a whole. And I think, I hope that these are encouraging images to consider what it is to apply them to contexts where it might be a rather small number of people are gathering. There may well not be professional uh, musicians to lead. And yet what it is to believe nonetheless uh, in the God who can do extraordinary things in those small settings. And of course, another aspect of this is to simply remember the origins of the church and the reality of Christianity largely spreading through people meeting in domestic settings without, uh, certainly without uh, professional musicians uh, leading on uh, in, you know, with with kind of musical excellence on instruments that might themselves cost thousands of pounds. There may well have been some instruments being played um, with great enthusiasm, um, but not necessarily with vast technical skill. And although, as I've said, uh, I love to go to a choral even song in a cathedral from time to time, uh, and indeed, uh, you know, I have some wonderful experiences at sort of vast Christian festivals led by highly accomplished uh, contemporary musicians. And um, for me, the point is to say, it's not only in those kinds of contexts that God can meet us. And actually, I think scripture is on our side uh, in this respect. The final image from Matthew 13, I just want to share, of course, is the pearl of great price. Uh, when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and brought it. And for me, that th this sense of being taken back to um, the extravagant value in the kingdom from a kingdom perspective of one person coming to faith or one person indeed coming newly alive uh, in their faith. It seems to me that we we worship a God for whom that uh, is amazingly good news when one per and of course the Christian faith spreads person by person, doesn't it? It is overwhelmingly the case that people come to faith or grow in faith when they receive encouragement from uh, another person. Um, and this is the pearl of great price. Uh, and so actually, uh, if we really long to see individuals growing uh, in their faith and coming alive uh, in the spirit, often this will be done very much more at a personal level than it will just in the context of being one of a thousand in a crowd. Uh, and therefore, to be able to think and reflect on how our sung worship in the place of music in these smaller contexts can help people move forward uh, in their life of worship seems to me uh, really important. So I want to leave you just with a, a personal encouragement. Um, just outside Telford, where I'm based, there is a very small village called Little Wenlock, uh, a very good Shropshire name. Uh, and um, my wife and I, I still have a go at the piano from time to time uh, and even the organ, uh, though that's rather rusty. Um, she plays the... Uh, and we've been involved with a tiny little village church uh, and there can't have been more than 15 or 20 people uh, at any of these evenings but um, with our limited musical resources but with a heart and a desire to do something and I hope with a, a reasonable sense of expectation they have been hugely uh, encouraging times uh, and I hope through the course of today uh, and the seminars that follow uh, we can uh, spread a little bit of that sense of encouragement, but also some technical and theological pointers uh, along the way. So I'm going to hand over to Roger, uh, who is going to take us to a psalm. Yeah. Thank you, Christopher. Um, 
I've spent a lot of my time in the Book of Psalms. I'm sure that we all have it. There's a psalm for every reason, a psalm for every season, and of course we spent time there. Um, but what I wanted to share with you is something that I share on my workshops when I do this is on how could there be a flow of praise based on a psalm mode. I'm going to choose Psalm 95. I'm going to see if we can look and see if there's a shape that we might choose whatever contest, whether we're in a small church or a cathedral, where there may be a flow. Of course, Psalm 95, that's the one, if you've got your Bibles there, have a look. It's what we know, uh, know as the Venite uh, in, in certain circles. I'm going to try and share a screen. This is where we hope the technology absolutely works again now. And uh, I, yeah, there we are. I'll give you that. Bear with, I'll get the right screen. There we are. Well, we know what we're talking about. Um, basically, um, and I'm draw, doing this in my book on worship works, Psalm 95 has some wonderful shapes and things, even if we only go for the first seven verses. Now, just look at the words for a minute. I'm, I'm going to read them to you. Um, but um, it might be sometimes when we're joining in, remember to mute yourself unless it's time to speak. Otherwise, we have interesting things. Come, let us sing for joy and uh, shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice. And my dot, 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 dots there, I'll just say, you know the rest. And of course, he's referring then to an Old Testament passage, but I want to highlight the very last phrase on the screen. We hope you can see it today if you would only hear his voice. That for me is one of the great challenges of whenever two or three, talking about small groups, are gathered together, that he's there. And the thought that when we come towards him with our hymns and our songs and our psalms, that actually we can expect to hear him speak. It's not about how good is our music making. It's really about how open we are to hear his voice. But how about this for a little shape? You notice the first line, come. And uh, I always think it's a good thing to think about if we're planning just a block of praise. Um, if we've got to invite people. And so the first word I'm going to use there is invitation, where we invite ourselves, we invite one another, we exhort one another to come, let us sing. Let's come before him with thanksgiving. So those first two verses are very much invitation. When you then look at the next three verses, it's about proclamation, because this is whether we're coming or not, whether we're believing or not, whether we're singing or worshipping or not. The next three verses are true. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The seas is for he made it and his, land, his hands form the dry land. Actually, those are just statements of truth. Again, a very, very good thing to do when we're singing, when we're declaring. This is why as Anglicans, um, if I'm assuming that most of us are Anglicans, but uh, we declare creedal statements. Creeds are important to declare truth. But I want you to notice when you get to the next verse, to verse six, it again starts with come. But I want you to see a progression because the mood has changed. Almost the mode has changed because now it is come. Let us bow down in worship. We're beyond singing here. This is nothing to do with what key we're in and what time signature we're in. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Even the word our in there is assuming personal relationship. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. And that's what I'd call the adoration section. And I'm going to challenge this in when we choose our music, whether it be for a house group, for an even song, for, for a small group, whatever, is I believe that we can we can bring those three elements into it. Invitation, proclamation, adoration. But remembering that God is more concerned with our heart than he is with our crotchets and quavers. You know, he'd rather us sing unaccompanied or sing out of tune and have a heart for him 
then if we get all the music side right, and yet we're not actually coming to that third point, that third paragraph, come let us bow down. And today, if we would only hear his voice. So it is just that most of us Anglicans would fit into that middle column where maybe within our service at the glorious spot, there is a time for a praise block. And uh, we, we did this with my previous church. We thought we really want to, we want to join some songs together. How are we going to do it within the liturgical framework? And actually, the liturgy provided lots of flexibility to do that. And in that, that centre column, which is where I guess most of them are at. But if you look at the left hand column, we'll call it the free church one. But this might also be a service of the word um, where, again, within that time, a time to flow in praise and we've all talked about the hymn sandwich kind of service which whether it be even song or a, a morning service we can very easily get into hymn sandwich where we sit down and stand up and up and down what we might always call seasick worship and there's nothing wrong for some of the the elements that we're talking about but i'm i'm encouraging us to focus at some point and coming close and that often sung worship will help us to do that. If we were in an evening praise or a, 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 a charismatic meeting, if you look at the right hand column, there may be 30 minutes of the first yellow bit and then at least 30 minutes of the ministry of the word and at least 30 minutes of prayer ministry, which would be tremendous. But that's not going to happen on a Sunday morning. Not quite like that anyway. I should also say that maybe for some of you, and we can discuss this in our groups, that maybe your praise block and I don't like the word block, incidentally, it's very ugly, but you can't think of another one. I hate the word medley, and it's not a Songs of Fellowship bingo where we call out numbers. It's a flow. So that's a little pattern where we share where you might be at. Of course, in the Eucharist, in the administration of communion, there is also a time for flowing. But that will be slightly of a different nature, which will be interesting to talk about. Some of you will have found a different space and a spot in the service for your praise block. But uh, what I want to suggest is that we're not abandoning the liturgical format. We're fitting within the existing structure and yet we're flowing. And therefore, we need to say at the end of the flow, make sure we stop to let and see what God is doing. But what's more important than anything is encountering the Holy Spirit. If I could just earth that just for a moment, I'll put that into a graph. With wherever we are at in the temperature of our building, we might well be in a cold start as far as intimacy with God is concerned. And then we move up that graph. And maybe here's an, one example to get you thinking and putting the uh, uh, earthing what we're talking about. Maybe a little chorus for Christmas from Christmas, but it doesn't have to be Christmas. I've come, let us adore him. That's not adoring him. That's saying, come and do it. And a song like Above All Powers, but you can think of hundreds of psalms and hymns and songs that just declare truth about God. And that's wonderful to talk about God. But actually, ultimately, it's I love you, Lord. It's the intimacy. And what the Bible teaches is as we draw close to God, he draws close to us. That's the bit that excites me, that whatever group we're in, and whatever size, the, the vision is to encounter him. And because he's got more to sing and more to say to us than we could ever think of to give to him. Okay, I'll stop soon, Jerry. There, Christopher. Thank you, Roger, uh, very much. So we're going to have about fifteen minutes now in. Uh, two groups with an opportunity for you to meet each other, those who would wish to to, to share, uh, share a little bit about your own context uh, and your own uh, challenges, but also hopes. Uh, and also, in a sense, to share a little bit about what you uh, are looking for uh, within the course of these uh, seminars, because, um, you know, we don't feel there's much point putting something on that isn't going to be practically uh, of use. So, um, we will shortly go into those uh, and then come back uh, after 15 minutes um, and continue the wider discussion then. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I was just cut off mid-sentence, um, uh, but um, the group I was with may not have felt that was a bad thing. 
Um, but anyway, uh, it's lovely to be back together. And I hope that's been useful to sort of feel as though you're getting to know at least um, half the people on the call. Um, we've certainly had some very interesting um, insights um, and a fascinating spread of locations and mm -hmm. denominations uh, indeed. Um, but a, a couple of things that really um, struck me, one was the question of um, performance, you know, and particularly if you've got a service being streamed online, um, to what extent that impacts um, and not in a good way. Uh, how you how you feel about things and um, also the question of who chooses the songs and we had some interesting uh, questions well hymns or songs or whatever but th the extent to which there can be a mixed blessing either because you feel this burden of the responsibility but also actually if you then receive um, a list which shall we say you wouldn't have chosen yourself but you are then being asked to lead um, there are questions there uh, Roger, I don't know if you want to give us a little flavour of any uh, any headlines from your group. Well, I think one of the things was that we were, again, very widespread geographically, but I think quite fairly widespread in terms of resources. We had a mixture of folks who really have almost no music resources and to those who've got the resources, but knowing how to develop and how to come to the point of intimacy. And I, I think having heard from everyone, we're, 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 we're limited resources. And but want to move forward into intimacy, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, well, and we also heard, um, you know, the um, the challenges that can be associated with organists. Um, I'm not going to say too much more at this point, but uh, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, but I say this as an organist myself, so I feel as though uh, yes. you know I'm not betraying anyone by uh, by by doing that. Um, well, in this next um, section, what we're going to do uh, is I've got some reflections to share on uh, particularly focused on the use of music and sung worship in relatively unstructured settings um, within an Anglican context. One might be thinking of the service of the word uh, or other uh, unstructured settings for, for praise and worship uh, in other denominational settings. Um, we'll have an opportunity for um, any responses, questions or comments um, after that. And then Roger will lead us through something similarly, but focused on communion services uh, and the place of music uh, within that. Uh, and then that will also again be followed by some opportunity for um, discussion amongst us. Uh, and then we will go back into those breakout rooms for uh, final conversation and prayer uh, towards the end. Um, I remember someone once saying to me um, a very simple sort of observation stroke question, you know, do people know why they're standing up to sing in church? The issue not being there whether they're standing, they might of course be remaining uh, seated, but is there actually a sense of why it is that people are singing in church. And of course, not every religious tradition um, values sung worship uh, or praise in the way that Christianity generally has done uh, and continues to do. Um, and so I do think um, it's worth taking a step back from some of the presenting issues of song choices and resources and technical ability, significant those though, though those are, to kind of ask the question, well, of the people, however many or few that there are who gather in the particular contexts you're conscious of, what is their underlying understanding of and experience of sung worship? Uh, do they have any kind of theology of praise, uh, if you like? So do they feel a sense, Roger has reminded us of the Psalms and of course, the Psalms are replete, aren't they, with a sense of God's people praising him. Um, but but do the people that we are with Sunday by Sunday have a sense of connection with what they're doing um, and that sense of, of the place of praise and the power uh, of praise? Um, indeed, one of the things that we often find very interesting, particularly in more traditional settings, um, is that if we go and, and run a day in a parish, people might suddenly say, um, 
you know, I've never actually talked with someone else in this church about my faith. Now, that may seem an absurd thing for some of you in certain kinds of contexts. And of course, there are some churches which are excellent at nurturing a sense of people talking uh, about their faith one uh, with another. Um, but have people shared their experience of what it is to praise God? Have they moments that they look back on that they see as significant uh, in that way? Um uh, and for me, for example, having grown up in very traditional Anglicanism, playing the organ, you know, singing in a choir, I think for many, many years of my life, my sense of encounter with the Holy Spirit would have been talking about a tingle down my spine in the last verse of a favourite hymn. Now, I've come to realise that that is the Holy Spirit and there is so much more of the Holy Spirit uh, than that alone. But um, it seems to me it's actually really important to be able to honour where people have noticed the presence of God and then encourage them to go deeper on that journey. Um, another example might be, well, you know, why is it that you always have a tear in your eye in the final verse of when I survey the wondrous cross? And that beginnings of an emotional connection. And again, we can tie ourselves up in knots and be concerned about the place of emotion but actually what's going on for that person uh in that moment um, and again for me personally i can remember a very small scale uh holy week service midweek almost no one there sitting at the piano playing when i survey the wondrous cross getting to the end demands my soul my life my all and really feeling gosh this this is a moment of calling for me, and it was it was just in the moment that I was exploring the call to ordination. Um, but even in a very small scale setting, it was something within that hymn that unlocked something uh, deeper for me. So there may be questions about making space for people to consider these questions of what is their underlying theology. And um, of course, some people would say, "Well, I stand up because it's about." a kind of corporate edification, you know, a corporate rehearsing of the truths about God. Uh, I suppose I would want to say, I don't ever see sung worship only as doing that. Um, so there are those sort of theological questions and making space for people to reflect on those experiences. Um, there are also the stylistic questions, I think, that we've already touched on, certainly in the group that I was with. Um, and I think one has to be honest about who um who is there and what for example their prejudices are you know is there someone who is sort of vehemently anti any song composed after about 1950 um and if they sort of voice that in a rather kind of combative way um then that will be unhelpful um just as if you're in a setting where largely things are highly contemporary um you know it's as if it's a sort of unforgivable sin to you know, to have a song or a hymn that was uh, composed before 2010. Um, I mean, I'm exaggerating on both counts in a sense, and probably most of us are somewhere more uh, in the middle. But I think recognising and naming some of those um, prejudices may be a strong way of putting it, but, but recognising, if you like, the kind of likes and dislikes, and then thinking, well, what is it to... Um, stretch people perhaps but not to the point that they snap if you like mm -hmm. um and again often when we're running a day with a local church we'll ask the question well what is your kind of typical range of songs or hymns um so that one can be sympathetic to that but also say well have you noticed that there are these songs which perhaps you're less familiar with which do invite people into a deeper sense of encounter with god um and are you are you even willing to kind of dip your toe uh, in that sort of um, those sorts of waters? I think the third thing I want to mention really is building faith when resources uh, are scarce. Um, I was really struck that our uh, our chair of trustees is an Anglican bishop, uh, John Holbrook in the Peterborough Diocese, uh, and he made a throwaway comment to me the other day, but um, just about the fact that so many of the parish visits he do does these days, uh, you know, he will be in a context where people are singing to backing tracks 
Uh, and that's a, a change that he's noticed, um, you know, in the last even 10 or 15 years. Um, so um, I'm just going to share a screen and just canter through just a few um practical um observations um of things that may be um helpful uh in this respect um bear with my um inevitable zoom moment um here we go yes that's roger and me just in case you were wondering um and so here we are so um i guess over many years there has been the kind of no organist no problem we'll put on a cd or possibly um an mp3 um and if you've got a lot of money you can buy, even buy a machine um you know to lead you through it and i guess some of us um will be ex will be familiar with this or perhaps even use these kinds of settings uh, yourself um and then there are the sort of more uh, more contemporary versions of the same idea um, with icing worship being one that I think is, is widely used. But if you're not familiar with it, it's worth making a note of. This is a subscription based model. So um, and it also needs some kind of screen to be projected uh, onto. But, um, uh, you know, works pretty well um, uh, for people um if you've got the the resources to invest in that um monthly subscription um and then the second um one mentioned here worship lyric videos we actually use for our uh retreats on a fairly regular basis if there isn't um a sung worship available the advantage of worship lyric videos is that they're available um uh song by song so you pay two or three pounds uh, to download a song that you can then run within a PowerPoint. Um, and so uh, I realise I failed to share my um, music. But just so you get an idea, um, you just embed it into a PowerPoint there and then the um, the words come up uh, as, as you go. Um, so those are just some very... Um, practical examples of the kinds of things um, that are uh, available in case you're uh, someone in our group preferred to, you know, doing kind of sing along with Spotify. So if you are currently doing sing along with Spotify or indeed just searching for things on YouTube, which of course varies hugely uh, in its uh, effectiveness, um, I would commend some of those um resources to you but i think ultimately uh, as roger has said and one of the things that we want to keep coming back to uh, in these sessions is the question of the heart uh, as one uh, approaches that um so therefore the and this relates of course to those prior questions of what is the kind of heart of worship with which people are approaching their time of singing together um and what are the things that one can do to encourage them uh, in that? Um, interestingly, someone in our group mentioned um, their own uh, fear even sometimes of speaking or praying between songs. Um, but of course, that can be uh, a very enriching way of enabling people to go deeper through the context of um, the kind of block of praise that Roger uh, is describing. Uh, and also if people have culturally been much more used to a hymn and then a reading and then another hymn and then something else. And, you know, um, it can also be a way of um, breaking things up, but without losing uh, the flow. So certainly um, uh, one of the things that Roger and I are keen to be able to do more practically on the residential retreat we're going to offer uh, is some of the examples of how one might uh, seek to to lead people uh, in that way. Um, the final observation that I want to offer, and then we'll open it up to comments and further questions from yourselves, um, is developing a sense of confidence in the human voice. Um, Lucy, I think it was within our group, mentioned that, you know, sometimes actually if if there's no organist, uh, you know, just as an emergency, actually if people are 
then forced to sing things that they know, uh, it can sometimes be better than if you're laboring away with, you know, an organist who's playing too slow or too quick or the wrong tune or, you know, the hymn book falls off the shelf at the wrong moment and, you know, the kind of chaos that can ensue. Um, but I actually think, particularly if you've got a small group of people, um, and in fact, Peter, I think it was, um, who is down in Cornwall, mentioned that he's often going to very small groups of people uh, in Methodist churches, um, but they have a strong sense of what it is to sing together. And so there isn't that kind of um, challenge of, of actually managing to to praise together. But, um, but my top tip uh, in this regard is um, to invite people to say who has got the next birthday in the group present. Uh, and once you know, hopefully God will deliver someone within the next week, sing happy birthday to them and notice what a confident, uproarious sound 10 people singing can make when they've stopped thinking about it because they're singing happy birthday. Um, now the next point is crucial and I have sort of, I did do this at a retreat <laughs> before Christmas and then felt I'd sort of sounded like a sort of angry school teacher. So the way not to do it is to then to kind of observe, well, look how well you can sing happy birthday. Why can't you sing decently when you're singing a hymn or a song? But essentially that is what I'm wanting to say to people to say, look, when you're relaxed, when you're not really thinking about it, look how well you can sing corporately. And so why is it that when it comes to singing God's praise, it's suddenly as if, you know, we've been zipped up uh, and the mute button has been pressed. Um, and just trying to encourage people to build up a sense of confidence uh, in what it is to sing together. And it may be that you have a crucial role. Um, you know, someone in our group said they can't sing. Um, and I think some of us kind of labour under that, you know, sense. And um I think all of us can sing. It's just some of us, um, you know, we may not sing close to the the notes on the page, but actually that doesn't stop you singing happy birthday to someone. Uh, and I think God wants to hear all of us sing, you know, musical warts and all, uh, as it yes, were. Yes. Um, so those were the sort of some of the things I wanted to to mention. But does anyone want to to come in on any of that or um, or, or say anything before we hear from from Roger? Do you just unmute yourself if uh, if you'd like to contribute? Can I just say, my husband, um, for me, was a great sadness when I first met him because he can't sing a note. Um, bless him. But it never stopped him singing praises to God. And I always say to people, if they say to me, oh, I can't sing, I always say, yes, you can. And when it gets up to heaven to God, it's perfect anyway. So it doesn't matter what it sounds like down here. It's perfect when it gets up there. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I, I was just going to say, because I mentioned Spotify, we do actually use No Organist, No Problem, which is available on Spotify. Um, oh. But we've nicknamed it No Organist, Lots of Problems. Um, simply because the number, if you even different carol, um, different hymnals have different numbers of verses in, and it doesn't say how many there are. And so unless actually you've, You've really planned and checked things ahead. Um, it, yeah, yeah, we've got lots of new problems. No, well, thank you. And it's really helpful to hear that uh, honesty. And, and I think it's partly why, if you have a screen, some of the other options are better. But I realise many people are in contexts where, where you don't have that. Uh, Jeff, good to see you. Yeah, hi. It was just to say, sometimes going, it seems, backwards from sun worship to the use of technology can feel like a real retrograde step. I think it's what we're going to have to do for, for, for some of the time. But I think that in COVID and those of us who managed to get um, stuff online discovered that it's possible to meet with one another and meet with God in some extraordinary new ways. And it's almost like kind of tapping back into that. And then the other thing I would say is I think the church near you, the resource hub, has a lot of uh, good, uh, more traditional sung material on there, but also some other stuff as well. No, that's a really good point. And I I didn't think to mention that. But yes, so a church near you, which you may associate more as the site where you 
you know, you type in to, to find a local service within an Anglican context, but there are a large number of um, resources available on there. Um, and there are word files which give you the lyrics that are being sung. Um, so, Lucy, you would still have to print them out or something, but um, but they do they do link together at least. Um, and anyone who is registered with a church near you can can access uh, those recordings. Um, yes. Can, can well, I, Roger, can we, um, do you want to say something and then move into your own uh, reflections? Yes, following up from where we're at, um, just a couple of things. Um, guy who wrote my favourite all-time worship song, which is King of Kings Majesty. I don't know how many. Wave if you know it, King of Kings Majesty. One or two. Do. Written by a guy called Gerard Cooper, who's definitely not an Anglican. He comes from Hull and uh, of a very big church but um, one of the things he's written a, a small book on worship but for the life of me I can't remember what it's called but the theme coming out throughout his book as a church leader was regularly teach my congregation about worship regard I mean even if you're following a lectionary it's amazing how often you can be teaching about worship because we spend so much of our time at church together in sung worship the percentage of our time we sing in percent of that. It is worth that much time in from the from the pulpit preaching about it so people understand it. And I think that's that was one of the things. And of course, me speaking as a former school teacher, it's interesting to stand in front of a class and you see how they're reacting. And if children are interested, they look interested. If they're not interested, they um they play up normally. You, and you know about it. And the danger with congregations is if they're um if they're not interested, um, they look bored. And if they're interested, sometimes they still look bored. And so beware of looking visually at it. But there is a difference, I think. And this is probably where we, it's a prayer focus, I think, more than anything. The difference between just singing a hymn, because this is what we do. And it's something we do, even if it's the gradual point in the Eucharist. It's something we do between the Old Testament reading and the Gospel, we sing a hymn. And so we're up and singing it and we hope God is listening to it and we're trying to do our best because we want it to be on um, beta and people can do that for all the best of motives. But actually singing to him and engaging him with him is more important if we're totally focused on whether we've got an organist or not. And um, and so on and all that, we're missing the point if we can only get folks focusing on how much they're loved and how much they're loved by God. And I think that's where it starts. Um, I, uh, I was in a, a, um, a meeting with a very high church leader. I think her name was Leanne Payne. And she had two fairly, I'm gonna be kind here, shall we say two fairly mature ladies playing non-amplified guitar. And that's all they did. There was no, no, there was no sound system around and we, we worshiped and they got to the planned um, the unplanned bit of improvised praise, and all they did was strummed one chord. And people were, because that congregation, that group of people wanted to worship, it all happened. It was amazingly free, based on one chord. And I came away thinking, I can do that. And that you can bring in another chord. And to have the kind of improvised singing that can be just with a, a, a chord sequence. And some of you will know what I mean like that. It's like stepping stones underneath the water. Um, you know, if we can get people, you know, the song Father, We Adore You requires a knowledge of only three chords on the guitar. I wish we could, somebody needs to write another worship song that's that simple, that just says, Father, we adore you. It's not asking him anything. It's not promising anything. It's just adoring him. And I think that's the bit of the, the top of psalm. Uh, of Psalm 95 at the top. Anyway, I want you to go on and talk a little bit about um, how do we, how did we get this into our church when we had a very traditional, first of all, it was a, a robed choir who used to sing Latin anthems in an area that was distinctly daily mirror reading. And that culturally needed to be faced. And we moved toward introducing the presence of the spirit to the church and in the end that choir most of whom stayed with the transition didn't want a robe anymore but wanted to sing worship songs to the extent when i tried to introduce some rutter they said this is too complicated 
we want to sing worship songs. <laughs> so they'd, they'd gone completely round on that. But the focus was nothing to do with music. It was all to do with Jesus. It was all to be, be excited by him and excited by the presence of the spirit. But then till we were faced with a morning service. We want to get this praise in. And we looked, as I said earlier, looked at the glorious spot. One day, this is what I, I tried. And I, I, being a, a, lay, a lay reader, I haven't promised to not do this sort of thing. <laughs> so therefore, I could just do it, you say. And I said, instead of singing the Gloria now, can we wait till I get to the sermon spot? So we got to the sermon spot and said, let's contrast singing the Gloria to singing the Creed. Most of us sing the Gloria as if we're singing the Creed or saying the Gloria as if we're saying the Creed. The creed is said in doctrinal truth, which is nothing wrong with that at all. The glory is not about creed. It's joining with the angels, which was the origin of those words, joining with the angels. Let's say the words of the Gloria really slowly and have a gap between the sections. And just stop. And then again, say these words to him. We say the creed in various directions to ourselves. To one another and i would say in a believer in the powers of darkness saying it to the devil as well we can tell him that the glory here is just talking to him let's slowly talk to him with the words of the glory and it, it emphasized the difference between singing about god and singing to him when we sing happy birthday we're singing to the person whom, and with whom we're in relationship and, and we don't worry too much if when you get to the last line, Christopher, I don't know about you, the harmony at the last line of um, happy birthday to you. In fact, there's sometimes nobody left singing the tune and people will say they don't read music. They can't harmonize. Yes, they can. It's to do with where we're looking and losing the wrong focus. So what I'd love to do is introduce you to my setting. Sorry, it's mine, but I've got the backing track for this. Um, I wrote a setting of the Gloria. But in a minute, you're going to see, oh, wow, it starts in D flat. And Jerry will say, guitarists hate D flat. Not if you've got a capo, they don't. And I wrote the Gloria in three sections, um, transposing each section of a semitone. Sorry if I'm talking speak that you don't get, but bear with through the pain at the moment. But the same chord progression. And we, we, I recorded it myself in the studio when we did the recording. Uh, I put using an, an, a sampled organ sound. And, and so we have a backing track. So I'd like you to hear it now without the backing track. But I want you to imagine if you could do it with just the backing track minus the voices. But that would be silly me playing that now. So bear with me while we try the excuse, extremely difficult set again of screen sharing with all that that involves. Uh, bear with me while I just tick some boxes. Can you all see that? Just nod your heads. That's right. Please don't join in or no, because it could be catastrophic if you do that. In a moment, I'm going to try then and pick up the backing. Oh, but if you notice the, the first bit, I think you might see my mouse. That's just a cue sheet to show you what the organist is doing. And even some pianists would have a fit for playing in D flat. But uh, my friend Chris Bowater said, if there's a key you don't like, spend a week practicing the scales of it. <laughs> you either give up or you, you, you succeed. Um, but what you'll notice is there will be, um, as long as I can get this to work, which I hope I can, we'll move um, the music. But this might I might not be able to move the music. Bear with, I'm going to try the track now. I hope I've not put a nasty blob on your screen. Let, here comes the sound, I hope.
I'll stop sharing for a moment. Okay, now, I have you noticed that um, I didn't, we weren't able to put the chords in and the music, but, but we, it does exist in a form where you can put the chords in. But each time, there were only about three or four chords used in each section, and then we just changed key and uh, so on. And I should say, Jerry, I see behind you lots and lots of ukuleles, are they? But I once met a church that had only got one guitarist who could only play three or four chords but they found him three or four guitars. And they had three or four guitars lined up with the capo in different place. And literally, it was changing the guitar. Now, it was easier to find guitars than it was guitarists who could play more, key, more chords. And, you know, it's one of these necessity breeding and being the mother of invention. Um, in my, my own church back home, we have we have two churches in, in Licky and near Bromsgrove. We have... One church that is fairly, we, we got rid of all the pews years before I came and we have a music group. And the other church, it's pews and not a church choir, although it's it's aching and longing for one, but there aren't enough people. But during Lent this last year, they decided they would sing the Gloria. And they haven't sung chorally for years. And they just, because, you know, Anglicans do amazing things in Lent like pray and read the Bible, I always, you know, go to house groups and that starts things. And they did the, um, they did that, that Gloria and they found it was very easy. But now I'd be interested to see what you felt about how easy would it be to sing along with that? Uh, any, any comments on that? Please don't try to be polite, just be honest. <laughs> I think if I if I can start, it it, it did strike me as quite easy because I'm thinking in a setting where I would be leaving leading people a cappella, and the glorious I know from chorister days, including John Rutter's and things, I love them, but they're very complex for people to follow if they're not. So, um, uh, and I'm getting fed up with singing the Peruvian Gloria when we're doing something. <laughs> So, so yeah, my response to listening to that was, "Oh, this is this is doable. It's it's more accessible than some." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most people will be very frightened by seeing it start in D flat. Did you notice that? Oh, Alex. I was going to say that we found finding a Gloria that the congregation can sing um, quite a challenge. And we settled on Appleford for the time being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think one of the problems with the Gloria and with a lot of the liturgy is um, is it's unmetrical. And therefore, it's very hard. An outsider coming in, who, even who may have a church background, if they don't know that setting, they can feel very put out if everyone else is singing away to a tune they don't know. Uh, I, I believe actually that um, with backing tracks, and I would say a few things about backing tracks, I, need, I think you need to know your equipment. You've got to have good enough equipment so that people can really hear that. The, the people at the front who are leading it, and say something about leading it in a moment, uh, they've got to hear it. It might need a fold back speaker. Uh, you've got to have quality speaker to play it to the congregation because sometimes I'll go to a church and they say, oh, we've got good a good sound system. And when I look at it, it's good for speech mm. and it, it's not good for anything else. So beware of that. Um, I think you need to know your backing track. Um, you know, just using backing tracks is not an excuse that you don't need choir practice or music group practice. You know, even if you have one singer or two singers at the front leading the backing track, they need to rehearse. Do not let the track catch you out. You need to know about your outros, your intros. You need to know if there's links between the verses because you can have the confidence if you've you've rehearsed. And there's something about body. If you see my body language, if I want to bring somebody in the beginning of verse, I'll go, Guitarists can do that easily. Difficulty if you're in the organ loft. But two people there, confident to sing and to sing. It's that body language. And um, one of the reasons for poor congregational singing, I think, in some churches, is people are frightened of becoming a, 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 a non-volunteer soloist. In other words, they're coming in the wrong place. I, I, I kind of spent years in front of children 
at, at the piano leading them to sing and they need the confidence to know so uh this is dangerous territory but uh on it being slightly on the loud side if you're using backing track because there is nothing worse than losing where you are and the whole thing's fall apart and people say there you are this backing track idea is no good you need to know your track you need to know your links and so on um you need to i think to, congregations need to feel the beat that doesn't have to be with drum beat but to feel the pulse of the music and therefore you know you don't have to be a music reader to do this you just have to be i think a worshiper and you need to just have a feel for the music you might not know what a beat is what i mean by a beat you know not know what an intro means but to knowing your track and liaising with your pa people so that in that case they're also i was going to say singing off the same hymn sheet uh, and keeping an eye on one another we need a bit more here we need a little bit less i suppose and the other thing i'll say about using screens and sheets um, is we do not any longer have to be slaves to the same number of verses of a hymn that is there in the hymn book i would warn you about changing words to copyright material we're not supposed to do that so for example if you have a problem with stuart townend's um in christ alone with the wrath of god verse you're really not supposed to change those words you can miss the verse out or you can not use the song at all but you're not to change his words and i'm speaking as a publisher here so end of rant but um you do need to hear that and, and so on um but you know there are many many verses of sims and sometimes we really don't want to sing all of them one of the challenges of some of them are so good you don't want to miss any ad and um, it is possible if you're into technology and if you're not into technology you've probably got a young member of the family who is using a free program called audacity you can actually put songs together so i have a praise block and they can flow and you can do that you can't do that with cds because as good as cds are you queuing them is not as easy as they ever claim that they are and you can flow and you can stop and uh, believe me i think there's a place for it in, in in whether you're using live instruments or tracks to stop part of worship is silence it's not all singing don't underestimate the silence and then the big challenge folks is when you've got to the end of a praise block what do you do next i've seen people say right we sung the last song it's as if the last note has just finished now let's sat down and we have the notices or we'll have a reading or something really good like the sermon but i would say if we've got people up that graph and if we've people got whatever backing track or live you've used either stop and say what's god doing now we've got there and if you've got a live instrument to encourage the guitarists to gently continue the chord sequence again know your relationship with your sound technicians because you've got to get the balance right so that if you're coming up to lead prayers or you're coming up to preach a sermon after after the praise block don't jump straight into it if we've got people to that point of focus of intimacy don't lose it let maybe the and the, a guitar or a keyboard gently playing chords underneath helps people to feel that the connection is continuing we've gone through the block of praise the connection is continuing this is not rocket science and you don't need to be fantastic musicians to do this in fact again as i said if you've got one chord that you can strum or pick gently it helps people to feel connected god hasn't stopped just because the music stopped i think that's what i really want to say christopher thank you uh so much roger and yes the one thing i'd got my prop here which i'd meant to um mention but uh, neglected to so um i mean i have one of these speakers i'm sure there are people who you know end up with a bluetooth speaker um but I I managed to sort of oh, there we are Jeff so we can all hold up our Bluetooth speakers. But um, you probably I used to have a, an older and admittedly cheaper one that every time you turned it on it said Bluetooth speaker connecting, which I don't feel is a really helpful uh, thing to hear in that 
you know, so I've managed this one. You can actually turn off all the notifications. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I remember I used it for the first time as an outdoor remembrance service where, uh, you know, this was responsible for the last post because there was no trumpeter available. Uh, and I was sort of living in fear that, you know, my children's latest sort of song choice would appear by mistake. But it didn't. It worked fine. It worked really well. But I do think, as Roger has said, it's kind of thinking these things through and thinking, um, how can I uh, do my best to enable people to have a deeper encounter with the living God uh, and the music be a way of enabling that rather than, either feeling like a kind of neutral thing or even worse, uh, actually being uh, a negative. Um, well, you know, as Roger and I were planning this, we were very much aware that um, all we can begin to do is sort of scratch the surface and highlight some headlines um, and areas for discussion. Um, but um, if you do have feedback, particularly in terms of things that you'd value in the next two sessions uh, on the 6th and 20th of February uh, at the same time, please do uh, email into the office uh, or to us uh, directly um, because, you know, we really do want to shape this uh, in a way that is helpful for you. Um, what we're proposing is that for those who would like, we will go back into the small groups and just have a time of open prayer to finish. We won't then come back into this whole group, so um, you can just leave from there uh, as you wish. But um, I hope this has been helpful. Please do, as I say, send any uh, feedback or pointers or questions for future sessions. Um, but otherwise, now we'll go back into those groups for um, a time of closing prayer. Really nice to meet you. Thank you for joining us and uh, see you soon.